Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are talking about coagulation drugs, and this is part one. First, a very, very brief overview of coagulation, just for review. We talk about primary hemostasis, which is really involving the platelets adhering to the site of bleeding and being activated. The platelets adhere, activate, stabilize, and they can also be inhibited. <clears throat> Secondary hemostasis involves the clotting factors, which all leads towards formation of the thrombin plug. There's an activation step where the injury leads to release of tissue factor and activation of factors 7, 10, 5, and 2, factor 2 being thrombin. Then there's amplification, which we call the thrombin burst. This activates the platelets as well as factors 5, 8, 9, and 11. Propagation is the creation of the fibrin crosslinks, which stabilize the platelets and create a fibrin plug. And finally, there's inhibition, which is the built-in checks and balances that break down clot as well as forming it. Fibrinolysis is the process of plasminogen being converted into plasmin, which in turn goes to degrade fibrin. The first drug we'll discuss is heparin, specifically unfractionated heparin. Heparin works by binding to a substance called antithrombin-3, which is a natural anticoagulant, and activating it. Antithrombin-3 inactivates many other coagulation factors as well as thrombin. Now, paradoxically, we may see patients who receive heparin and don't have the response that we expect. In that case, they may have a deficiency of antithrombin-3 due to excessive bleeding or cardiopulmonary bypass or something like that. And so, paradoxically, even though we think of FFP as being full of coagulation factors, we may need to give FFP in order to make heparin work better in those patients. Patients can also have acquired, rather, these patients who have acquired antithrombin deficiency can get it, like we said, through DIC, sepsis, acute thrombosis, liver or renal disease, being on ECMO or cardiac bypass, hemodialysis, surgery, or trauma. When we dose heparin, we dose it in units, where a unit of heparin is the amount that would prevent one milliliter of citrated sheep's or cat's blood from clotting for one hour. Heparin is usually given IV or sub-Q. We don't like to give it intramuscular because of the risk of formation of a hematoma. Heparin is charged and does not cross the placenta. Heparin can be difficult to dose because of the non-linear dose-response dose relationships, and this is partly due to its extensive protein binding, and its elimination half-life actually changes based on the dose that you give, although it's usually around an hour or two. Usually we use heparin in the inpatient setting. We don't send patients home with heparin. It's hard to measure heparin levels, so usually we measure heparin activity. There are heparin activity assays where we measure anti-factor 10A activity, Previously, we looked at the PTT, and we would try to maintain the PTT at one and a half to two and a half times the patient's baseline level. Most commonly in the operating room, we look at the ACT, the activated coagulation time, which is easy to use and works very well for heparin. The blood is mixed with some sort of activation substance, and then we measure how many seconds until a clot is formed. Usually we measure an ACT before heparin is given, and then again three minutes after the heparin is given to compare with the baseline. In most surgical procedures, we want the AC to be, ACT to be twice the baseline for a vascular procedure. A bolus might be around 5,000 units IV or maybe 70 to 100 units per kilogram. For cardiopulmonary bypass, we want to see a much higher ACT, somewhere in the 300 to 480 second range. In those cases, the heparin bolus is 300 to 350 units per kilogram, so we're talking about 20 to 30,000 units of IV heparin. Heparin has many other clinical uses. It can be used to prevent and treat all sorts of clots, like a thrombus or a thromboembolism, like a DVT or a PE, a mural thrombus in the heart, acute MI, which is a thrombus in the coronary vasculature. It's used to prevent clots forming when patients are on extracorporeal devices, like ECMO, coronary bypass, or hemodialysis. Heparin is also used to prevent deep vein thrombosis in patients who are at risk, like hospitalized patients. 5,000 units subcutaneously every 8 to 12 hours, increasing to 7,500 units for patients who are very obese. 
This is especially important in hospitalized patients, surgical patients, and especially hip replacement patients. If a patient does have a blood clot, the dose of heparin would usually be a loading dose of 80 units per kilogram, followed by an infusion starting at 18 units per kilogram per hour. If you're following PTTs, you would titrate to one and a half to two and a half times the normal value, or you can follow anti-factor 10A assays, or you could check ACTs. Obviously, the most concerning side effect from heparin is hemorrhage or hematoma formation. Patients can also have allergic reactions since he heparin does come from animal tissues. There is something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, and it's called HIT. There are two types of HIT. HIT type 1 is non-immune, and we really just call this heparin-associated thrombocytopenia. In these patients, the heparin leads to enhanced platelet aggregation and clumping. It occurs in more than 10% of patients who are exposed to heparin for a few days, but their platelet count usually remains above 100,000, and they don't have a lot of clinical bleeding or thrombosis. The platelet count will gradually rise again, even if you maintain heparin, and so new, no treatment is typically indicated. On the other hand, HIT type 2 is immune-mediated. There's a PF4 receptor that leads to formation of antibodies that activate the platelets. And these patients, um, th this occurs in about 5% of patients who are exposed to heparin, and these patients can have HIT occur anywhere from 4 to 20 days after heparin exposure. Although if the antibodies are already present from a prior exposure, then HIT can occur within hours. HIT type 2 is severe. It's immune-mediated, and the platelet count will drop below 100,000, although usually it will stay above 10 to 20,000. Their PT and their PTT may also be prolonged. Since we call it HIT with two Ts sometimes for thrombocytopenia and also thrombosis, we do see thrombotic events in anywhere from 30 to 80 percent of patients, and they're at risk for MI, DIC, DVT, PE, and necrosis of extremities, with a mortality of up to 30 percent. In these patients, you need to stop all heparin and try another form of anticoagulant, like bivalrudin or agatroban. Heparin is reversed with protamine. Since heparin is an acid, protamine is a strong base that combines with the negatively charged heparin to form a complex. The dose of heparin is one milligram, sorry, the dose of protamine is one milligram of protamine per 100 units of heparin believed to be in circulation. So if you just gave heparin, then it's easy, but if it's been a while since you gave the heparin, we have to calculate and perhaps reduce our protamine dose based on how much time has elapsed since the last heparin dose or since the effusion was stopped. This chart shows just one example of an approach to protamine dosing, showing the full milligram per 100 units of heparin if heparin was dosed recently, and scaling it back to 0 0.75, 0 0.5, or even 0.375 milligrams per 100 units of heparin if the heparin was last dosed more than two hours ago. In the absence of heparin, protamine can actually have its own anticoagulant effect. So don't think of protamine as something that promotes coagulation. It only inactivates heparin. You must know the side effects of protamine. They are hypotension, pulmonary hypertension, and allergic reaction. These are very important for you to know. Certain patients are at increased risk for an allergic reaction to protamine. They include patients who have a fish allergy, patients who've had a vasectomy, and this data is sort of limited to case reports, and many patients in these categories have received protamine without an allergic reaction. We think that some mechanism of this allergy comes from the fact that protamine is derived from salmon sperm. But to be clear, patients who have a shellfish allergy should not be any concern um, when administering protamine. Also, NPH insulin contains protamine. That's what the P in NPH stands for. So patients who have been exposed to that insulin may have an increased risk of protamine allergic reaction due to prior sensitization. So that's all unfractionated heparin. Next we'll talk about low molecular weight heparin. Most commonly, we use anoxaparin or lovinox. These also bind to antithrombin-3. They also have activity against factor 10A. There isn't as much protein binding compared with unfractionated heparin, so it's a little bit more consistent and predictable in its pharmacokinetics. 
Often we don't check labs at all with low molecular weight heparins. It doesn't have much of an effect on PT or PTT, although you could follow the anti-factor 10A assay. The elimination half time is longer, usually four to five hours, and it can be dosed once or twice daily. If you're trying to let it wear off, you would delay surgery for at least 12 hours after the last dose, and it is definitely renally cleared. It's only partially reversed with protamine at about 65%, Low molecular weight heparins might be used in patients having an MI or unstable angina, as well as prophylaxis or treatment of DVTs or PEs. The prophylactic dose is 40 mg sub-Q daily for prophylaxis. If they're at high risk, you might give it every 12 hours instead. For full anticoagulation to treat for an existing clot, you would go with 1 mg per kilogram sub-Q every 12 hours. This drug is safe for use during pregnancy. But we need to be careful in our pregnant patients because patients on, hep on any kind of anticoagulant, including this one, are at risk of developing a hematoma when we perform a neuraxial block. Low molecular weight heparins are less likely to cause thrombocytopenia and HIT than the unfractionated heparin. The next drug we'll discuss is warfarin or Coumadin. This is not an IV drug, it's an oral drug. Patients take it to prevent or treat DVTs, PEs, a thrombus associated with atrial fibrillation or prosthetic heart valves, or hypercoagulable disorders. Warfarin works by inhibiting an enzyme called vitamin K epoxide reductase. This leads to a deficiency of the vitamin K-dependent factors, and you should know what those factors are. They are factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and protein C and protein S. Warfarin doesn't have any effect on platelets. When you start warfarin, the first factors to be inhibited are proteins C and S. Now, while the coagulation factors make clots, proteins C and S are actually anti-clot. And so when we inhibit those proteins C and S, the patients can become transiently hypercoagulable. So for that reason, we usually start patients on heparin. Once they're therapeutic on heparin, then we start the warfarin. And we continue the heparin until they are therapeutic on the warfarin, which means that they have their target INR. At that point, we can stop the heparin. Warfarin's onset of action is 8 to 12 hours, but its peak effect is not for 36 to 72 hours. And its effect continues for 2 to 5 days after stopping therapy. So this needs to be considered when scheduling surgery. The first side effect of warfarin is bleeding, especially intracranial hemorrhage. When patients have too much warfarin in their system, we can reverse it. We can use vitamin K, 1 to 5 milligrams, given sub-Q, IV, or IM, and that will improve their PT or their INR within about 6 to 8 hours. That's kind of slow. We try not to give it IV or else give it very slowly because there can be some side effects or allergic reactions. You could also give FFP up to 15 milliliters per kilogram to replenish the vitamin K-dependent factors. PCCs, which we'll talk about later, are another treatment for rapid reversal of Coumadin. People used to use factor 7A, but that's no longer considered to be ideal. Warfarin crosses the placenta and can damage the fetus through damage to the CNS, bleeding, and developmental defects. We don't use warfarin in patients who are pregnant or are at risk of becoming pregnant. It is metabolized by one of the cytochrome P450 subtypes, types 2C9, and that interacts with many other drugs. Any of these drugs that are given could change your Coumadin levels. Even changes in your dietary vitamin K content will alter the clinical effect of warfarin. So patients have to be dosed and then their blood has to be taken to measure their PT, their prothrombin time, or their INR. Usually the target INR is between 2 and 3. Warfarin is 97% protein bound. We'll stop here. Please let me know if you have any questions and continue again on the next recording.